Chapter 4, Making and Using Compost. In this chapter, not-so-secret ingredients, siding your bin or pile, no-fuss, cold compost. Is it done yet? Making the ideal hot pile, tips for faster compost, survey of composting bins, a garbage can composter, a simple large bin, triple bin, the Cadillac of composters, Composting with earthworms, outdoor worm bins, sheet composting, pit or trench composting, using your compost, and the compost troubleshooter. Compost is the best form of organic matter to add to your soil. It's a mix of organic materials, such as grass clippings, garden waste, and kitchen scraps which have decayed into a crumbly dark mass, a balanced, slow-release source of nutrients. Compost can keep soil stocked with all the micronutrients plants need. It supplies small amounts of major nutrients and helps soil hold on to nutrients and water long enough for plants to use them. It increases the overall health of your garden by suppressing disease organisms in the soil. When sprayed on leaves in the form of compost tea, it can suppress leaf spots, mildews, molds, and other leaf diseases. Compost also encourages beneficial soil organisms, which feed on disease organisms or make nutrients available to plants. Compost is so simple that you might as well make it yourself instead of buying it. After all, you're just trying to speed up nature's nutrient recycling program, which goes on constantly all around us. There's no need for an elaborate system Simply piling leaves will do if you're not in a rush. If you don't have deciduous trees, you can make concentrated compost, pure humus, from kitchen scraps with a low-maintenance indoor worm bin. If you want to make compost quickly, build a hot or active pile. Under ideal conditions, the organisms responsible for decomposition will experience a population explosion generating lots of heat. You need to mix the right balance of materials that are carbon-rich and nitrogen-rich and turn the pile often to give the organisms enough oxygen. If you'd rather not bother with a hot pile, you can make great compost using cold or passive piles. Just pile up whatever materials you have on hand and turn the piles rarely if at all. To speed things up, turn often and make sure to chop the ingredients before piling. Not-so-secret ingredients. Many materials are good for composting, including a variety, helps to ensure a well-balanced supply of micronutrients. Remember that tough materials, such as sticks and corn stalks, take, take much longer to break down than softer materials unless you chop them into small pieces. Balance, browns, and greens. The best compost is a mix of browns and greens. Browns are dry or dead plant materials such as fallen leaves, straw, and wood shavings. They supply lots of carbon. Greens are fresh plant materials and fruit and vegetable scraps from the kitchen regardless of color. These supply nitrogen and protein. The best source of protein are animal byproducts such as manure, milk, blood, and wool, and these don't fit into a color category. Sidebar Master Gardening Tip Use Activators Any substance that speeds up decomposition in your compost pile is an activator. Generally, activators supply nitrogen, protein, or microorganisms, or both. Save money by making your own from the ingredients here. Avoid synthetic fertilizers which contain no protein and seem to inhibit compost organisms. Activators work best if mixed in thoroughly. If you'll be turning your pile soon, simply spread a thin layer every six inches or so. Use only one cup of dry meal per layer, but up to a two-inch layer of soil or compost. Nitrogen protein sources. Alfalfa meal, blood meal, dehydrated manure, fresh grass clippings, fresh manure, hoof or horn meal. Microorganism sources. Compost, the fresher the better. Fresh or well-aged manure. 
healthy humus-rich soil or strips of sod. Microorganisms. Microorganisms that produce compost need a balanced diet of carbon, their energy source, and nitrogen-rich protein. Unless you use materials that provide a balance of these, which you can see on the chart, top each six-inch layer of carbon-rich material with a two to four-inch layer rich in nitrogen, or add about a pound of nitrogen protein-rich material for every 30 pounds of carbon-rich material, about three-fourths of a hay bale. Extra high-carbon newspapers and fresh sawdust need twice as much nitrogen-rich material to balance their effects. Anything that's already started decomposing has more balanced content than fresh material and therefore needs less nitrogen. If you have too much nitrogen, though, the pile could start to smell. If you don't want to bother keeping track, don't worry. Without enough nitrogen, assuming no other factors in the compost troubleshooter in page 82 or shown later, apply, your pile will still break down only more slowly, but it won't heat up. Boost nutrient content. Some ingredients are added to supply nutrients to the soil when you use your compost. Thin sprinklings of wood ash boost potassium and phosphorus content. Sprinklings of rock powder, such as granite meal and green sand, supply potassium and many micronutrients, though very slowly. Don't add limestone or thick layer of wood ash, which contains some lime, unless your compost is finished. If the lime comes in contact with high nitrogen materials, it creates ammonia gas and you'll lose the nitrogen by evaporation. Composting chart, what to use. Nitrogen, protein rich, greens, fresh grass clippings, fresh manure, kelp meal or seaweed, legumous plants like peas or beans, crushed eggshells, cabbage leaves, broccoli, the whole cabbage family, but don't include the roots because that can spread the diseases that involve the root, like club root. Sour milk, apple or winery pomace, blood meal, cottonseed meal, wool, soybean meal, human hair, and coffee grounds. Some people don't include milk because it can also encourage rodents and things to, to come and dig in your pile. Carbon-rich browns, straw and hay, leaves, pine needles, they are slow to break down though, corn stalks, sawdust, wood shavings, shredded newspaper, dry grass clippings, dry brown weeds and garden trimmings at the season's end, and rice or coca hulls. Those with balanced are manure with the bedding, a well-aged manure, pea and bean pods, fruit peels and cores, vegetable peels, soil and sod, fresh weeds, rotted wood, and soft green garden trimmings. What to avoid and why? The material, diseased plants. As I mentioned above, that may spread disease if the compost doesn't get hot enough. Weeds with seeds or weeds that can sprout from bits of root. Those may survive and sprout in the garden. If the compost doesn't get hot enough to kill them, it's best just to stay away from that, especially things like quack grass. Fresh sewage, biosolids, pet feces, and used kitty litter. They may carry parasites and diseases that infect humans. Non-biodegradable items, glass, synthetics, and pressure-treated wood. They won't break down, so you'll just have to pull them out of the finished compost. Toxic chemicals like pesticides could kill the composting organisms. Don't use things like charcoal, as in briquettes. They will not break down in the compost. If you want to use that, you should use biochar. Coal, coal dust, and coal ashes may contain levels of sulfur and iron, which can be toxic to plants. Fats, oils, and grease. Large amounts can attract animals and keep anything they coat from breaking down. Meat scraps, bones, and cheese can attract, large amounts can attract animals, and they are also very slow to break down. And I feel like New York City. Get me to the farm
composting systems at a glance. Hot composting and cold composting are the main systems. All the rest are variations. Bins, or boxes and tumblers, are simply containers for making hot or cold compost. Many appear under Survey of Composting Bins, which is included later on page 66 and 67. Hot compost requires a minimum volume. Bins or piles must be at least 3 feet by 3 feet and filled to about 4 feet to allow for settling. Bins and tumblers that hold less than a cubic yard are good only for cold composting. The last three systems are easy alternative to piles and are all variations on cold composting. Type Hot, fast outdoor pile. Advantages Fast results kills weed seeds and pathogens. More nutrient rich than slow cold piles because there's less leaching of nutrients. Less likely to attract animals or flies. Also called active composting. Disadvantages Requires careful management and lots of effort to turn and aerate. Works best when you add a lot of materials at once. Cold, slow outdoor pile. It's easy to start and add to. You can add material continuously a little at a time. Slow maintenance. The resulting compost is especially rich with beneficial soil organisms. Also called passive composting. Disadvantages. It takes a year or more to decompose. Some nutrients are lost to leaching unless the pile is covered, and it can attract animals and flies and doesn't kill weeds or diseases. The bin or box. It's very neat in appearance, holds heat more easily than a freestanding pile, deters animals if covered. The lid keeps rain from leaching the nutrients. It's great for use with hot or cold piles. Does require time to build or money to buy. Decomposition is slow unless you turn the materials inside the bins and you may need to add water from time to time. The tumbler. Very neat in appearance and can produce compost quickly if ingredients are finely chopped and balanced. It's easy to aerate by turning. Odor is not usually a problem. No nutrient leaching into the ground. Good for cold composting, usually not large enough for hot composting. Disadvantages. They're relatively expensive and the volume is relatively small. It rarely is large enough to heat up as a hot pile and works best if the material is chopped, added all at once, and you may need to add water from time to time. In cold areas, people have noticed that mice do get into them and nest in them in the winter. Garbage can or plastic bag. It's easy to do year-round and can be done in a small space, requiring little effort, though you must poke aeration and drainage holes in the garbage can. It's very inexpensive, though, but it's only used for cold piles. Mostly anaerobic, so smell can be a problem. It can attract fruit flies. You must ensure correct carbon-nitrogen ratio to avoid a slimy mess, and it doesn't kill weeds or diseases. Triple bin. Relatively easy to turn material into adjacent bin. One bin can be used to stockpile ingredients while another holds unfinished compost. It accommodates easy either hot or cold piles. Disadvantages, it's best only for a large volume of material. Turning and aerating does require some effort. Worm composting, it's easy, has little or no order. It can be done indoors or out in a small space. It can be added to continuously. Castings are so nutrient rich they can be used as a fertilizer. It's a good way to compost food waste. It does require some care when adding materials and removing castings. You have to protect the worms from temperature extremes can be known to attract fruit flies and may not kill all the weeds and diseases. Sheet composting can handle large amount of organic matter. No container or turning required. It's an easy way to improve soil over large areas and boosts, er, and boosts earthworm populations. Materials can take several months to decompose though. It requires effort to spread and doesn't kill weeds or diseases. Last, the trench or pit. Quick and easy, no maintenance, no investment for materials, and boosts earthworm populations, doesn't attract flies or animals, and kills many weeds or diseases. It does have some drawbacks as it requires some effort to dig a pit or trench, incorporates relatively small amounts of organic matter, and only improves a small area. Siting your bin or pile. To start composting in your yard, first choose a good site. Pick a relatively level area so you won't have to haul finished compost uphill to the garden. 
If you plan to use manure over heavy ingredients, pick a spot where you can easily dump these nearby. Shade is ideal in hot climates, sun better in cold climates. Finally, nothing dampens composting enthusiasm like a sour smell wafting through your window, so don't cite your bins or piles just upwind from or right next to the house, at least not until you've made a few odor-free batches. If your site is in a low spot or poorly drained, elevate the pile on a mound of soil, rot-resistant boards, or a discarded pallet. Sidebar, did you know the power of compost? A case study. Researchers at Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station have been running experiments since 1982 to see how compost affects yields of common vegetables. While it took four or five years for the benefits to show, the results were impressive. In some soils, compost can completely replace added lime. Test your soil periodically to make sure. It also greatly reduces the need for fertilizer. Yields of vegetables from unfertilized soil given an inch of compost each year equal those that grown in fertilized but uncomposted soils. Small amounts of fertilizer, preferably based on soil tests, really boost yields when teamed up with a little compost. For the experiments, amendments were applied every year. Compost made from oak and maple leaves was spread an inch thick on all but one of the beds. The control bed got no compost but received the full recommended rate of fertilizer and lime. Other beds got different amounts of fertilizer and lime plus the compost. After 12 years, the yield from the bed that got everything, the full rate of amendments plus the compost, was 25% higher than the bed that got no compost but just the full rate of fertilizer. Another bed got two-thirds the recommended fertilizer plus compost and produced similarly high yields. The plot that got no fertilizer or lime, just leaf compost, still produced the same amount of vegetables as the control bed. Soil getting compost had almost twice as much organic matter as the bed with no compost. As a result, compost amended soil held nearly a two-week supply of water. This reduces plants' water stress and the need to irrigate. All the organic matter also buffered the soil's acidity. The pH of the bed that got only compost and no lime increased from 5.6 to 6.6, .6, right into the optimum range. Later tests that substituted other types of compost for leaf compost produced similar results. No Fuss Cold Compost any pile that doesn't heat up is by default a cold pile. If you don't want to fuss with ingredients or layers or exert any effort to turn the piles, you don't have to. Cold compost is great for the garden. It contains an even wider array of beneficial soil microbes than hot compost. It just takes longer to make. Cold composting works well with any size or type of bin or pile. The simplest form of cold compost is leaf mold. Pile leaves, chopped, if possible, in the corner of the yard and forget about them. In a couple of years, you'll have wonderful leaf mold, which is just nature's compost. A fancy tumbler can produce compost relatively quickly, but many are too small for contents to heat up, and these also make cold compost. Even a well-layered, frequently turned bin may produce cold compost if it has too much carbon. The ingredients are too dry, or rain soaks it. Bagging it... You can make cold compost anywhere, even in a plastic garbage bag. Unlike the other methods discussed in this chapter, this is anaerobic, oxygen-deprived composting. The most noticeable difference is that the anaerobic compost smells. People who make anaerobic compost unintentionally by creating a totally soggy pile find this out. You won't be able to smell anything as long as the bag is sealed. Be prepared for a strong odor when you open the bag, though. Fortunately, the smell disappears quickly once contents are spread out and exposed to nitrogen. Fill a large bag with a mix of chopped leaves, grass clippings, and kitchen scraps, or add a sprinkle of activator for every couple shovelfuls of bulky, carbon-rich material until the bag is nearly full. Sprinkle a couple quarts of water over the contents and mix until all the ingredients are moistened. Shake small or light bags, roll large or heavy ones. Tie the bag closed and leave an it in an out-of-the-way spot where it'll stay above 45 degrees for a few months. For faster results, turn it over every few days by simply rolling it on the ground. Yeah.
Is it done yet? Compost is finished when it develops a sweet, woodsy smell of rich soil and most ingredients have become crumbly or fluffy, dark brown soil-like material. Some large or recognizable pieces usually remain, but everything's a relatively uniform dark brown color. Master Gardening Tip Why compost? To save on fertilizer cost. Improve the soil tilth and fertility. Increased to increase numbers and activity of beneficial soil organisms, to improve soil pH, to reduce pests and diseases, to recycle kitchen and yard wastes. Compost is finished when the center of a hot pile is no longer warm and if you turn your pile it no longer heats up. After you've made a couple of batches you'll recognize the difference between finished and unfinished compost. If you're not sure, you can try the following test. A simple test. Soak a couple of large spoonfuls of your compost in a cup of water. Fill another cup with plain water, distilled as best, or let tap water sit overnight so the chlorine can evaporate. Put eight or ten radish or lettuce seeds in each cup and soak them overnight. Dampen two paper towels. Strain off the water and spread the seeds on separate paper towels. Place the towels in separate plastic bags and keep them warm for a few days until the seeds sprout. Check periodically to give them some air and make sure they're moist and not soggy. Both batches should germinate equally well. If there's a difference of only one or two seeds, it may be with the seeds rather than the compost. If significantly more seeds soaked in plain water sprout, it shows your compost needs to sit longer before being used near seedlings. You can use unfinished compost only as a mulch for shrubs or trees. Sidebar hints for success. Collecting kitchen scraps for compost. Make it easy to save kitchen scraps. Find a suitable container and keep it in a handy spot. Keep a lid on it to contain odors and keep out fruit flies and house flies. A handle makes hauling easy. Try keeping a bucket of sawdust next to the container and cover each addition of scraps with dry sawdust. This soaks up excess moisture and cuts down on flies and odor. If you can stand to make frequent trips to the compost pile, smaller containers are nicer because they get emptied and rinsed out more often and therefore less apt to smell. Large peanut butter tubs with handles work well. Some people use ceramic containers or cookie jars. I use the large Heinz ketchup and mustard containers. They have a built-in handle grip on the side and a lid on the top. They fit great in the dishwasher. Making the ideal hot pile. Hot composting takes more effort than cold composting, but you'll be rewarded with faster results. Your pile will also generate enough heat to kill pesky diseases and weeds. Materials a bin or site for the pile, three to four feet by three to four feet by three to four feet. Chopped compost ingredients, compost activator, hose or spray nozzle, and a lid or tarp to cover. To make hot, fast compost, follow all the recommendations under Tips for Faster Compost on page 64 to 65. In addition, make your pile or bin at least three feet square and three feet high. Four feet's even better. The site should be well drained. Stockpile ingredients next to the bin or pile so you can assemble as much as possible all at once. 1. Spread 6 inches of loose, bulky, carbon-rich material on the bottom of the bin or pile. Cover with a 2-inch layer of fresh, nitrogen-rich material. Use only 1 inch if material is dry. 
add up to two inches of kitchen scraps, weeds, soil, or other balanced material. Two, unless you used fresh manure for the nitrogen layer, add a handful of fresh compost or good soil, or a strip of sod. For your first batch, you can use a purchased activator to supply microorganisms. A handful of compost from this batch can then supply your later batches. Three, water the layers until the materials are evenly moist but not soggy. Four, repeat the steps until your stack is three and a half or four feet high. Don't worry if it's taller than your bin. The height will drop fairly quickly. Cover with a lid or a tarp. Five, after a week, ten days or so, turn your pile, mixing the layers thoroughly as you turn. The materials should be warm and steamy. Turn every week to ten days until the ingredients are partially broken down and no longer hot. It should be ready to use in three to six weeks. Tips for faster compost. Whether you make hot or cold compost, the following tips apply. The more of them you follow, the faster you get finished compost. If you're not in a rush, you can ignore them. Sit back, relax, and let nature take its time, and you'll still get good results. Start your pile when it's warm outside. Organisms in compost work slowly when it's cold, and they stop working. They freeze. Warm season piles are ready sooner than cold season piles. Maintain a balance of about three parts carbon-rich material, browns, to one part nitrogen or protein-rich material, greens. Cover every six-inch layer of bulky loose brown material with a two-inch layer of green. You need only one inch of dry powdered nitrogen source, such as blood meal. Or you can mix three parts of brown to one part greens as you run materials through the shredder. Turn your pile using a garden fork or aerating tool. Each turning cuts the rotting time by about half. Turning speeds up decomposition by mixing and aerating. Chop all the materials. A shredder is very handy for making lots of compost quickly. Otherwise, mow over small piles of leaves to chop them. Cut stiff stems into small pieces with hand pruners leaving out woody material unless you're willing to chop it finely. Break up baseball bats, zucchinis with a shovel. Chop kitchen waste, especially tough rinds like citrus, melon, banana peels, before tossing them in your compost bucket. Dry eggshells overnight and then crumble them finely into your compost bucket. Be careful adding things like roses and um, other things with spines on them because those spines don't always break down and they're no fun to find in your garden. Cover your compost. A tarp or layer of inverted sod helps keep the pile and bins moist in dry climates and keeps rain from soaking them in wet climates. It also prevents nutrients from washing away. If you don't cover your pile, make a shallow depression in the top to collect rain in dry climates and in wet climates around the top to sh shed the rain. Check moisture levels by digging a 6-8 to eight inch hole in the pile and feeling the edges with your bare hands. Piles that are soggy or dry take much longer to break down than those that are evenly moist. Materials in the pile should feel moist to your fingers, but not so wet that you can squeeze out moisture. Remember to aerate your piles. Try a compost aerating tool available from gardening suppliers if you don't have the energy to turn your piles. Or, for automatic aeration, you can lay perforated drain pipes in layers as you build up your pile. If you find your pile to be smelly or full of flies, make sure the outer layer on that is as a carbonaceous layer, and that'll reduce both the smell and the flies. And I feel like New York City. Get me to the farm. Survey of composting bins. Wire mesh bin, 
a wire and wood bin. Wire mesh bins are simple and inexpensive to build. Wire and wood bins are mostly are more costly and more complicated. For stability and longer life, use half-inch mesh hardware cloth. One-inch chicken wire is less expensive and easier to worth, work with, but is less stable and doesn't last as long. A good compromise would be a half-inch chicken wire. You can purchase kits, usually sturdy plastic-coated wire panels that are even easier to assemble but slightly more expensive. They are easy to turn and aerate because the bin can be removed from around the pile. To turn, place the empty bin next to the pile and fork the material back into the bin, mixing as you go. Almost effortless to move when empty. It's mostly dog-proof, but not raccoon or rodent-proof, except for kits with lids, so may not be suitable for urban areas. Does not com camouflage the compost pile. A cement block bin. Simple to build, requiring no special skills, and somewhat more expensive than a wire bin. The area must be level. A single three foot by three and three quarters foot bin requires forty three standard cement blocks, seven and a half by seven and a half by fifteen inches, plus four half blocks. Lay a row of blocks three deep on the sides and four deep across the back, facing holes outwards for aeration. Stagger the joints for stability using the half blocks at the front edge of alternating rows. Five rows will give you about a three foot tall bin. It gives easy access for turning and aerating, but it must be reconstructed to be relocated. Provides easy access to animals. Doesn't camouflage the compost pile unless sighted so that only the cement blocks are visible. A straw bale bin. Simple and inexpensive to build. Stack straw bales three high and form three sides of a square. Reuse until the bales start to break down, then pull apart and compost them, buying new ones for the sides. Additional bales, or a thick layer of straw on top, provides insulation to extend the composting season in cold climates. It offers easy access for turning and aerating, but must be reconstructed to, locate, to relocate. Provides easy access to animals, does not suitable for urban areas, does not camouflage the compost pile unless it's sited so that only the bales are visible. Make sure that you use straw and not hay, as hay is more likely to contain grass and weed seeds. Wooden bin requires time and woodworking skills to build. It's expensive, especially if you use rot-resistant cedar rather than pressure-treated wood. You can reduce cost by Im and improve aeration by using hardware cloth for the sides. Front boards should be made easy to remove. Kits are easy to assemble but expensive. There are, are kits for multiple bins as well as single bins. They are sturdy and long-lasting, though. It's hard to turn and aerate in it unless you have multiple bins built side by side. It's also hard to move or relocate, so choose a good site. It's animal-proof if covered and closed in the front, and many people find them to be more attractive. A tumbler. Expensive, but requires little time or effort to assemble. Easy to turn and aerate. Doesn't usually hold large enough volume for hot composting, but always relatively fast for cold composting if the material is chopped, loaded all at once, and turned frequently. Types that turn end over end, or spheres that roll, do a better job of mixing than cylinders that spin horizontally. Very easy to move when empty. Generally animal-proof and good for urban areas and attractive, but as I mentioned earlier, um, some people do find that mice can get into them and build their homes in them in the cold weather. Stationary plastic bin. Expensive, but requires little time or effort to assemble. Available in a range of sizes and prices. Many are now made from recycled plastic. See a garbage can composter next for an expensive alternative. Hard to turn and aerate except for models that come apart and reassemble easily, so it's best for cold composting. Smaller models don't hold enough for hot composting anyway. Decomposition is slow unless the material is chopped, added all at once, and aerated frequently. Easy to move when empty. The lids make these generally animal-proof and attractive. I would think that mice could still get into them, so that might be a problem for people in northern areas during the winter. Garbage can composter. A large plastic garbage can makes a tidy, inexpensive bin that fits even the smallest yards. It's perfect if you only have small amounts of material to compost, such as kitchen scraps plus a few garden trimmings. Once your bin is full, let it sit 
at least a couple of months so that everything inside can break down. It will take longer if you don't stir or aerate the contents. If you're in a rush to use the compost, you can sift or dig out the older finished material in the bottom and toss the rest back in the can. For non-stop composting, start a second bin and move the first to an out-of-the-way place until its contents are ready. Materials. Heavy-duty 8 or 10-gallon plastic garbage can with a lid. Drill with a half-inch bit. Rubber tie-down strap to hold the lid securely in place. Three bricks. A tray, optional, and a covered bucket or small garbage can filled with dry, loose soil or sawdust. Drill eight to ten holes in the bottom of the can. Space the holes four or five inches apart up the sides, staying at least four inches away from the handles and the rim. Don't drill holes in the lid. Pick a convenient spot and arrange your three bricks so they can provide a stable base. If your can sits on a patio or deck, place a tray underneath the bricks to catch any drips they can stain. Place two to four inches of dry, loose dry material, chopped leaves or straw in the bottom. Three, cover every additional four inch layer with an inch or so of soil or sawdust or two inches of chopped leaves. Or sprinkle the soil on sawdust over every addition to soak up excess moisture and keep away flies. Attach the lid securely with a tie down strap to keep animals out. Try rolling the can around periodically to mix and aerate the contents. Add enough water to moisten the ingredients if they dry out. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm A simple large bin. If you want a sturdy, simple to make compost bin that can handle larger volumes of material, wire mesh is the answer. A five panel bin is more effective than a square one, as the material in the corners of a square bin never heats up and takes a long time to break down. A cylinder of 36 inch wide chicken wire is even simpler, but flimsier. Materials 15 feet of sturdy, two foot wide, plastic coated wire mesh 12 or 16 gauge 20 metal or sturdy plastic clips or plastic coated flexible wire ties heavy duty wire or tin snips pliers work gloves one cut five three foot long sections of wire mesh leave long wires along one cut edge of each panel the top and cut those on the other edge the bottom flush with horizontal wire Using pliers, bend over and clamp each long wire flush with the mesh. 2. Attach the long edges of each panel to the adjacent panel forming a pentagon. Clip or tie each seam at the top and bottom and in two places in between. 3. Find or create a level site large enough to hold two bins side by side. To turn and aerate, tug the bin up and off the pile. Place the empty bin next to the pile. Fork the piled material into the empty bin, mixing well. Triple bin, the Cadillac of composters. For composting large volumes, nothing beats the triple bin system. The first bin holds new accumulating layers. When this bin is full, the contents are turned into the second bin for curing. Once most of this material is broken down, the contents of the second bin are forked into the third bin, which holds compost until it's finished. These directions are for the smallest dimensions that allow a hot pile. 
for hot, fast compost, chop all the materials and turn the piles in place every week or ten days in addition to turning them into the next bin. This design uses wire mesh for maximum aeration and to reduce cost. You can substitute cedar boards or pressure treated wood for the sides. Space them at least a half inch apart for air circulation. Wear work gloves when handling hardware cloth and wear eye and ear protection when cutting lumber and assembling the bins. Materials. Four ten foot pressure treated two by fours. Eight six foot pressure treated two by fours. One nine foot two six foot and six three foot two by twos pressure treated. Two six foot cedar two by sixes. Nine six foot cedar one by sixes. Twenty two feet half inch three foot wide hardware cloth to be cut into one nine foot piece and four thirty seven inch pieces. Twelve half inch carriage bolts four inches long with washers and nuts. Three pounds sixteen penny galvanized nails half pound eight penny galvanized casement nails two hundred fifty chicken wire staples two ten foot sheets of clear corrugated fiberglass roofing four ounce two foot wide three eight foot corrugated wood strips forty gasketed aluminum nails for corrugated fiberglass roofing two three inch zinc plated hinges for the lid four flat four inch corner braces with screws and four flat three inch T braces with screws. The tools you'll need would be a hand saw or circular power saw, a drill with half inch bits for the bolts and eighth inch bits for nails, screwdriver, hammer, tin snips or sturdy wire cutters, tape measure, pencil, three quarter inch socket rent, wrench, carpenter square, and optional power stapler. Cut one, 31 and a half inch and one 36 inch piece from each six foot two by four butt end nail the four pieces into a 35 by 36 inch square repeat for three other sections cut four 37 inch long sections of hardware cloth bend edges back one inch stretch cloth across each frame check frame for squareness and staple screen tightly in place every four inches around the edge Two, cut nine foot pieces out of the four ten foot boards. Two of these will be baseboards and one will be the top board at the back. Save the last board for step six. Position the four dividers on the edge parallel to one another, three feet apart. Measure and mark center points on the two inside dividers. Position the two baseboards on top of the dividers. Make sure the outer dividers and sides are flush with the ends of the baseboards. Measure three feet in from each end and mark positions for two inside dividers. Line up the center lines with the three foot marks, making the front edge flush with the baseboard. Drill a half inch hole through each junction, centered one inch from the inside edge. Secure baseboards with carriage bolts, but don't tighten just yet. Three, turn the unit right side up and repeat the process for the top nine foot board and back using a carpenter square or by measuring between the opposing corners and adjusting until measurements are exactly equal make sure the bin is square tighten all bolts securely fasten nine foot long piece of hardware cloth securely to the back side of the bin driving staples every four inches around the frame now make front slats and runners making the divider to be put in front of the other section. Four, cut four 36 inch long two by sixes for front slat runners. Nail one securely to the front of each outside divider and baseboard, making it flush on top and outside edges. Center the remaining boards on the front of the inside dividers, flush with the top edge and overlapping about an inch on each side, and nail securely in place. Five, Cut the six three foot two by twos down to thirty four inches long for the inside back runners. Nail one inside runner parallel to the front runners on the side each divider, leaving a one inch gap for the slats. Cut all the one by six cedar boards into slats thirty one and one quarter inches long and insert into the runner slots. 
do not nail in place. You want to remove these slats to get out your compost. The runners will allow you to easily slide the slats in and out. Make the fiberglass lid. Six. Use the last 9 foot 2 by 4 for the back of the lid and the 9 foot 2 by 2 as the front. Cut the 6 foot 2 by 2s into four 32 and a half inch lengths for the sides and center braces. Lay out into position on the ground and check for squareness. Screw in corner braces and T braces on the bottom side of the frame. Center lid frame, brace side down, on the bin structure and attach the hinges. Cut corrugated wood strips to fit the front and back 9 foot sections of the lid frame. Pre-drill nail holes in the corrugated strips with an 8 inch drill bit and nail the 8 penny casement nails. Nail with 8 penny casement nails. Cut fiberglass approximately 3 foot lengths to fit flush with the front and back edges. The ridges run front to back. Overlay pieces at least one channel wide to keep out rain. Pre-drill each nail hole in fiberglass and corrugated wood strips on the top of every third hump and nail with gasketed nails. Composting with earthworms. If you want to continue composting through cold winters or blistering summers, indoor earthworm bins are the answer. They also work well for apartment dwellers who want to recycle kitchen scraps and for people with tiny yards. Worm castings are richer than other forms of compost. They're one of the best soil conditioners and one of the best, one of the most balanced sources of nutrients. You can buy bins complete with worms. It is very easy to make your own and much less expensive. Materials. Plastic bin with handles and matching lid approximately one and a half by two foot and at least eight inches tall. A drill with half inch bit. Plastic tray as large as the bin or a sheet of rigid plastic large enough to cover the top. Two pieces scrap one by two or two by four wood about a foot long. Fiberglass window screening. 24 by 18 inches newspaper or chopped leaves, a spray mister or watering can with a sprinkler nozzle, sturdy, long-handled plastic spoon, and about two pounds of red wiggler worms. Locate your bin in a basement, storage room, or garage that stays above 40 degrees and below 90 degrees. Try to keep the bins at 60 to 70, where composting worms are most active. Order red wigglers or red worms. Lumbricus rubellus or brandling worms, Asinia foilida. Suppliers are listed in the appendix. If you know someone who composts with worms, ask them for three or four cups of bedding with lots of worms. Ordinary earthworms won't work. 1. Drill holes in the bottom of the bin, four to five inches apart, or melt holes with a fat metal knitting needle size 15 or so heated in the flame. Use pot holder and open window to vent the fumes. 2. Lay wood scraps flat on the tray and place the bin on top. If you can't find a large tray, use the lid as your tray and make a new lid out of a sheet of rigid plastic. A plastic garbage bag will work well if you punch a few holes in it for air. Lay fiberglass screening over the bottom of the bin. It should come about half, about an inch or two on the sides. Fill bin halfway with moistened bedding. Rip newspapers into one to two inch wide strips and mist or sprinkle until moist but not soggy, or moisten chopped leaves for bedding. Release the worms on top of the bedding. 4. Feed your worms vegetable or garden trimmings and or coffee grounds. Don't add anything from the what to avoid list on page 57 and don't add eggshells. 
worms avoid them. Peel back the bedding, add the scraps, and replace the bedding to minimize odors and fruit flies. 5. Start with a couple pounds of food a week. After several feedings, use a spoon to dig a hole for new additions. Or spread new additions on the top of the existing bedding and cover with fresh or moistened bedding or a sprinkling of sawdust. If you use a lot of acidic material like coffee grounds or sawdust, sprinkle a tablespoon of lime over the bin every few months. 6. Leave the lid ajar for ventilation. If the contents start getting soggy, pull the lid back to let in more air. If they start to dry, close the lid or mist with water. You can close the lid completely for a week or two at a time without harming the worms. Keep bedding at least three inches below the rim and loosen periodically with a spoon. 7. Whenever most of the material looks like soil, you can remove castings by scraping finished compost off the top a little at a time. Or push all the compost and worms to one side. Fill the empty half with new moistened bedding. Add food scraps only to the new bedding. After a few weeks, many worms will have moved out into the new half, and you can dig out the old and leave most of your worms behind. Repeat whenever one side appears ready for garden use. Outdoor Worm Bins Here's an easy variation of earthworm composting. In summer or where the winters are mild, try outdoor worm bins. Start with an 8, eight or 10-gallon plastic trash can. Cut the bottom or and drill or punch several holes in the sides. Dig a one to two foot hole and sink the can part way in the ground. Fill as in for as for indoor bins and replace the lid. Check the moisture level often and add dry bedding if soggy or sprinkle with water if it's dry. The worms will slow down in cool weather and die if it gets cold. Try covering with hay bales for insulation, but an indoor worm bin to overwinter the worms is a better idea. If you dig up earthworms for outdoor bins, instead of using red wigglers, they'll simply retreat deep into the soil to overwinter and return the following spring. Sidebar hints for success. Dealing with fruit flies. Fruit flies can sometimes be a problem around compost buckets or indoor earthworm bins. You can minimize fruit flies by keeping the buckets covered and carefully covering each addition of food, or at least fruits, scraps, to your bin. To minimize the risk, avoid storing uncovered fruit in your same room. Vacuuming is one of the easiest ways to control fruit flies. Turn on the vacuum, open the lid, and whoosh, watch them disappear. Empty the vacuum bag outdoors. Hanging old-fashioned sticky flypaper strips above the bin will work for small numbers of flies. Disposable baited traps are now available from suppliers that sell organic controls. To make your own, make a paper funnel with an opening no larger than a quarter inch. Pour one quarter cup of beer into the jar set the paper funnel you made on top run tape around the top edge of the jar to eliminate any gaps between the jar and the funnel fruit flies will fly in and drown in the beer beer works better than fruit baits because the flies can't lay eggs in it if you don't want to use beer try molasses but it is harder to wash out of the jar though master gardening tip how hot is hot to find out how hot your pile gets you'll have to take its temperature Specialized compost or soil thermometers are sturdy enough to push into piles. Well-made hot piles usually reach about 160 degrees. To kill most weed seeds and diseases, your pile needs to maintain this temperature for a few days. Only the most heat-resistant weed seeds and some viruses will then survive. If a pile only gets to 120 degrees, it may take a couple of months to kill the same organisms, and some will probably survive. If you don't want to worry about temperature, simply bury pest or disease-ridden plants and troublesome weeds away from the garden rather than trying to compost them. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm
Sheet composting. Sheet composting just means working horizontally, spreading material in wide layers or sheets over the ground. It's very simple. You let earthworms and soil microbes do the composting and mixing. No bins, no turning. Any nutrients that leach will be absorbed by the soil below for future plant use. It's a great way to start a new bed, especially in the lawn. You skip the hard work of digging and removing sod. It's also great for lucky people who have more material to compost than they can keep up with. All it takes is planning ahead. Materials. Lawn mower, string trimmer, pruning shears or saw for woody plants, lots of newspaper or corrugated cardboard, limestone or sulfur, ordinary compost materials about one and a half cubic yards or 50 square feet, wood chips or other attractive mulch for top layer. 1. Mow existing plants as short as possible, leaving the clippings. Cut off any woody plants at ground level and chop them into small pieces. If clippings are sparse, sprinkle a dusting of another nitrogen source over the area, manure, alfalfa meal, or fresh grass clippings. If your soil is usually acidic, sprinkle some limestone. Substitute sulfur for very alkaline soils. Sprinkle some granite meal to ensure micronutrient supply if you wish. 2. Spread a weed-smothering layer of newspapers 8 or 10 sheets thick, or cardboard, over a large area. Overlap edges by 4 inches so that no weeds can poke through. Dampen the newspapers to make them easier to work with. Spread a 3-inch layer of manure or compost. You can substitute chopped leaves, but try to include a little compost or manure. You'll need about a half a cubic yard to cover the 50 square feet. Add a six inch layer of coarse material such as garden trimmings, wood shavings, straw, kitchen scraps, or chopped leaves. Try and use a mixture. Mix grass clippings or sawdust with other materials or with each other to keep either from forming a waterproof layer. You'll need a cubic yard to cover every 50 square feet. Try for a nine to 12 inches of total material on the top of the smothering layer. Water well to soak all materials. Five. Spread more newspaper, six to eight sheets thick or cardboard overlapping edges to smother any weeds or seeds in the preceding layer. Cover with two to three inches of wood chips, pine needles, or other attractive material to improve the appearance and to hold the newspapers in place. Sprinkle water over this layer to help hold it in place. Now just sit back and wait six months. Sidebar. Hints for success. Sheet composting in existing gardens. Many people are already sheet composting but don't realize it. Spreading a thick layer of chopped leaves, used straw mulch or similarly similar compostable material over your garden and turning it under is another form of sheet composting. You can rototill the material or turn it under by hand with a garden fork or shovel. If you do this in the fall, either leave the soil in large clods or spread a thin layer of chopped leaves over the soil to minimize erosion and leaching. The leaves will be converted to humus by spring. You don't even have to turn the material under if you don't mind waiting longer for it to break down. Pit or trench composting. The simplest way to compost if you don't mind digging is right in the soil. Dig a hole or trench in the ground, fill it with kitchen and or garden trimmings and cover with the removed soil. In a few months, even the most stubborn clay will be crumbly, easy to dig and loaded with earthworms. Pit and trench compostings don't give you compost to spread, but they work wonders on the soil in that spot. Sidebar, master gardening tips, words to the wise. Don't try to dig your trench when the soil is bone dry. It's hard to work. Wait until the soil is most moist, spring or fall in most areas. Don't dig your trench when the soil is wet. Use the squeeze test to see if your soil is ready to dig. Squeeze should hold together lightly. And if you touch it, it should fall apart. If water squeezes out, it's too wet. Where water freezes, you'll need a waterproof container filled with dry sand or sawdust to cover kitchen scraps during the winter. Spread soil over the top in spring. Trench composting is perfect if you want to return kitchen or garden waste to the soil, but don't want to worry about the carbon-nitrogen balance or turning your piles. It's an excellent way to improve soil for a new bed if you can plan six months ahead. As with sheet composting, if you eventually decide to double dig or build raised breads, you'll have made the soil much easier to dig and improved its structure. Pit composting is a good way to dispose of diseased plants. Use it in addition to a regular pile if you don't want to worry about whether your pile gets hot enough to kill diseases. 
just locate your pit away from the garden and cover diseased material immediately with several inches of soil. Here are several easy variations. For a new small bed, make your trench the size of the desired bed. For beds larger than two foot by four foot, dig out only that size at one time. After filling the first trench, repeat until you've covered the entire area. Remove the sod and set it aside. Dig out soil to about one and a half feet deep. Lay the removed sod upside down in the bottom of the hole. Don't do this if you have quack grass or any of those other rhizomous grasses that will uh, come back up inside that, because no matter what you do, they're going to come back up. Add plant debris, covering every new addition with some of the removed soil. If you add four to six inches all at once, cover this thick layer with a couple inches of soil. Once the trench is filled, spread any remaining soil over the top. Let it sit six months, and you're ready to plant. If you want to improve the soil in an area of your garden, plan on keeping it out of cultivation for a season. Dig one or a series of trenches, as described on page 78. Fill with any of the usual compost materials and let set until turning over a, hand, a shovelful reveals finished compost. You'll notice a tremendous difference the following growing season. Year one. Dig trenches next to your garden bed, leaving a walking space. Simply pitch garden debris into the trenches, adding a thin layer of straw, dried grass clippings, or chopped leaves from time to time. Be sure to remove any weed seeds or infested or diseased plants first, burying them well away from your garden. Fill in the compost trenches with soil and organic matter and leave it in place over the winter. Year 2. Dig a new trench where your garden bed was in the previous season. Allow the organic matter in the old trench to decompose completely by using that space for a walking space. In year three, you plant your new bed in the humus-rich soil of year one's compost trench after fluffing it up from being walked on. Fill in a year two's compost trench for a walking space and begin composting in the old garden bed. You've now completed a full cycle and can begin again from the top in the next season. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm using your compost. Compost is superb as the soil improving amendment, top dressing, and mulch. Finished compost can be used anywhere in the garden. To maximize its benefits, use finished compost within a few months. Like well-aged manure, though, even the oldest compost still improves soil. Sidebar, did you know a Midwestern study compared compost with stockpiled feedlot manure? Test plots using only compost produced yields similar to those fertilized with four times the volume of manure. The compost raised pH and levels of organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium more than could be accounted for by the nutrient content of the compost. The study concluded that the compost must increase the availability of existing soil nutrients while also supplying small additional amounts. Gardeners rarely have enough compost. Ideally, all beds, vegetable, perennial, shrub, even lawns and trees, should get an inch of compost every year. An inch is enough to provide fresh cultures of soil organisms and to maintain soil that's already in good shape. If you're trying to correct physical problems, such as poor drainage or structure, or if your soil is very low in organic matter, you need to use even more. In warm, humid climates where organic matter breaks down very rapidly, try for two inches. If you don't have enough compost to go around, concentrate on trouble spots. 
soil that has poor structure or drainage, or is lacking in nutrients, and hot spots where disease or pests are a problem. You can get away with half as much if you use green manures or maintain a constant cover or of organic mulch. Add a handful of finished compost to the bottom of each hole when transplanting small seedlings. Add a shovelful for larger plants and heavy feeders such as tomatoes, melons, and squash. Sprinkle finished compost into rows when planting seeds. For use in potting soil, or to spread as a top dress on lawns in spring or fall, screen finished compost to remove large pieces. For most uses, a half-inch mesh is enough, is fine enough. Staple hardware cloth to a frame of a 2x2 two two or 2x4 two wood. If you add legs on one side of a large screen, you can toss shovelfuls against the screen to sift, either onto the ground or into a garden cart. Or you can size the frame to lay across the top of the cart or plastic garbage can so the finished compost falls into the container. You can spread unfinished compost over the garden in fall. It will finish breaking down by spring and may be left on the surface or tilled under. Avoid spreading unfinished compost around vegetables and flowers as a top dressing, though. To use it as mulch on annual flowers or vegetables, spread a layer of finished compost underneath. You can use unfinished compost alone as a mulch for shrubs and trees. Finished screened compost is an excellent ingredient in soil mixes for houseplants and even for starting seedlings. You don't have to sterilize it. Unsterilized compost contains organisms that suppress ever-present damping off fungi. If the compost is newly made, use the test on page 61 to make sure it's really finished. You may want to test commercial compost too. It isn't necessarily finished by the time it reaches you. Unfinished compost can harm germination and growth of many vegetable and flower seedlings. Compost can be used as a foliar fertilizer in the form of compost tea. See page 129 later in the book where they explain it. This liquid form of compost can be sprayed on or poured over leaves or used to water house plants. Compost tea is great for giving plants a nutrient boost and controlling some diseases. Compost troubleshooter chart. You can solve most composting problems simply by just waiting. Most material will break down eventually without any effort on your part. If you don't want to wait a year or more for nature to take its course, follow the remedies below. Symptom. The pile doesn't heat up and feels dry. The cause. It is too dry. The remedy. Add water until the materials in the center feel evenly moist. In dry climates, cover pile with tarp and water whenever it dries out. The pile doesn't heat up or heats up only in the center, but feels moist. The cause, it's not large enough. Make sure your pile is three feet square and at least four feet tall when you start, or wait for the pile to undergo cold composting. Large pile doesn't heat up, but feels moist. Cause, not enough nitrogen. Add some alfalfa meal, manure, grass clippings, or other nitrogen protein source in as you turn the pile. Pile cools off before most of the material is decomposed. Cause needs to be turned. Turn the pile with a Gordon fork, mixing the material in the center with the outer or undecomposed material. The pile smells bad, feels soggy or wet. The cause, it's too wet. Add shredded newspaper, straw, or other dry, carbon-rich material in as you turn the pile again. In wet climates, make sure you cover the pile to keep off rain. The pile smells bad, like ammonia, and feels moist, but not soggy. Cause, too much nitrogen or not enough air. Add shredded newspaper, straw, or other carbon-rich materials, plus water to dampen it, and then turn the pile to aerate. Use less nitrogen-rich material in your future piles and turn more often. All the material doesn't break down, cause too dry or not enough nitrogen. For compost material that is too dry, add water until the materials in the center feel evenly moist. In dry climates, cover the pile with tarp and water whenever it dries out. For compost needing nitrogen, add alfalfa meal, manure, fresh grass clippings, or other nitrogen protein source and turn the pile. Matted layers don't break down. Needs mixing. Turn the pile, breaking up the matted layer and mixing it with other materials. 
Some pieces didn't break down. Pieces too large, too woody, or not biodegradable. Sift compost. In the future, leave out whatever didn't break down or chop into smaller pieces and add more nitrogen-rich material. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm